the suckling pig on the spit was what everybody just loved. It was one of the biggest crowd pleasers you could possibly imagine. But the Boudin Noir, that would be, for me, my personal favourite because that was such a, a, a triumph in texture, flavour and, and skill set. didn't always go right. <laughs> this is The Crackling. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Working in some of the best restaurants under incredible mentors can give you the grounding to go on to great success as a chef. But for some, delving into the world of professional butchery, as well as learning the chefing trade, has given a greater understanding of the anatomy of an animal and the best ways not only to cook it, but to use every little bit too. This is the building blocks that created the foundation for Darren Templeman to take his nose to tail approach to the craft. And it's led to a new gig where the best quality meat is front and center. Darren, you've done many things in your career, but you've had a real dedication to the pig and celebrating it in many of the restaurants you've worked at. What is it about the pig that fascinates you? Um, versatility, uh, flavor, and just goddamn deliciousness. That's it, end of the day. Do you remember the first time that you had to break down a whole pig and were there any um, challenges involved? Oh, for sure. So what I used to do, I used to work in a casino in Mayfair. This is going back into the late 80s, early 90s. And um, on my day off, I would travel up to Walthamstow, to Waltham Forest, and do a butchery course. So I was like an apprentice butcher. Um, so I was working with all, I was a chef as, as such, you know, just a chef to party. And I was doing my, my day off as a as an apprentice uh, butcher with all these you know butcher types. So there was me as a chef, you know, with my my nice little knife set, <laughs> and turning off with these guys with a, a chainmail glove, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, like a like a hatchet basically. And yeah, so I, I did a um, a butchery course with these guys, which was absolutely fantastic. Which then led into me. Um, doing two or three nights a week at uh, Smithfield Market in London. So I'd wow. finish, my sh- yeah, I used to finish my shift at about midnight, then cycle, when I was still cycling, <laughs> cycle across London down to Smithfield and uh, do maybe three or four hours there with the guys. And I started off just on like um, shoulders and bellies of pig and then eventually you know, progressed to the, to the whole pig. And when I first did it, I, the sense of achievement was massive, but I was so nervous with all these giant butchers around me, man, all covered in blood, staring at me. I was like, oh my God, here we go. <laughs> but yeah, no, since that point, I was just like, yeah, this is, well, what a life. Well, what sort of difference does it make, you know, having that skill um, when you're then going on to, to cook various parts of the, of the pig? immense uh, every chef should do you know a, even just a, a basic butchery course because it's something that's really getting lost now in the modern kitchen you know um you're having all these like you know the pre-packaged like steaks are coming out pre-portioned but to break you know to have the ability to break down an animal even from like a, a suckling pig yeah, it's it's a great skill set to have and i think really important for a chef for sure what was food like for you when you were young in, in your family Okay, so growing up on a council estate in the in the in the seventies and eighties in the UK, like mum was a great cook. She was a school dinner lady as well, but she was also a great cook. <laughs> and uh, she used to, you know, spend all her Sundays making like bakewell tarts and jam roly polies and biscuits and stuff and sponges. But uh, like, yeah, it was you know the rest of the the rest of the week, you know, apart from Sunday where you had the roast dinner, the rest of the week, you know, it was it was awful. There was liver. You know, there was all kinds of stuff. And um, I remember once, there was one time, there was one occasion we went out with my with my father. Uh, I went to the moors in Devon, we rabbit hunting. They brought back a few rabbits. The next door neighbor, he helped skin them and stuff. And um, yeah, it was quite amazing. And like that night, you know, we thought nothing else of it. Me and my sister, we just go off, we play, you know, football, we go out and do whatever. And uh, that night we see on the table, beautiful pie <laughs> golden golden crusted pastry and mum tells us it's swan pie and and we've sat down and we've you know thought nothing else it's like delicious we're smashing through it absolutely gorgeous and she tells us as we finish and we're just mopping up the last of it with a bit of crusty bread 
And she's like, oh, that was the rabbit. And me and my sister went into hysterics. We were like, oh, you can't be feeding us rabbit. We just, you know, unbelievable. Just been out. We're happy to go out and kill them on the moors. But, you know, then to ease them, it was a different situation. And it was just like, since it's a story, but my mum denies now, but me and my sister was like, it happened. That so happened. You were happy to feed a swan. <laughs> yeah, and we were happy to eat it. That's the funniest thing. Yeah, bizarre. Yeah. What what led to an interest in food for you to start a journey as a chef? Oh, look, yeah, because we weren't, uh, we, were on a, we grew up in a council estate in the UK. So, you know, for us, you know, food was, um, it was to fill you up. It was to, you know, it was substance, you know. Um, but my interest was like, you, know, you see the things that were happening in the food world, you know, chefs were just starting to, you know, this is maybe eight, 86, 87, and, uh, you know, just starting to make a name for themselves as such, you know, the, the, you know, Marco Pierre White was just coming forward, you know, there was all these like, you know, uh, Pierre Kaufman was always around, you know, um, Nicol Adonis was about, these chefs were like, you know, doing stuff I've never even heard of, you know, I've never even seen anything like this, and it was just captivating, and, um, like a lot of my friends at school, they all went in because it was a naval town. They all joined the navy or the marines, and I was just like, "No, that's not for me. That's not a life I, I envisage." And I'm very happy I didn't do that. Um, so I, yeah, I joined the YTS, part of Margaret Thatcher's um, "Get the Youth Working" type thing. It was twenty eight pound fifty a week uh, for forty yeah for forty hours. And I joined a one star Michelin restaurant, and yeah, that that was the journey started. Take us back to the first time you worked in a commercial kitchen. What was it like? So, whilst working, at uh, going to school still. So I left school at 15, um, 15 and a half. So, uh, went back to finish off my uh, my CSE. And, uh, yeah, so did a bit of a work experience at the Holiday Inn. And I'd say the big German chef there and the whole brigade, it was all, it was all guys. You know, and you could see how hard they were working. They were really... Yeah, you know, the the team was working so well together. They were, you know, a good bunch of good group of guys. They were all cooking some great food. They had great camaraderie. And that's where I first started to feel to myself, you know, I, I can belong here. I feel really happy here, you know. You know, working away, doing some really tasty food. And yeah, apart from the the scary head chef, because I was, I was just a young lad at the time, and I was just like, Wow, this is this is where I fit in. This is really where I fit in. And then transgressing from oh, sorry, moving on then to uh um, uh, to the Michelin star restaurant, the Shane Lu, and that was lost like different level again. You know, yeah. You know, all of a sudden, I've gone from working in in a huge kitchen with with maybe twenty five, thirty chefs on per shift to five of us maximum. You know, and uh, Jacques, yeah, and Jacques, the head chef, was just like you know, completely over everything. There was no room for 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 maneuver. There was no room for error. It was quite uh, quite amazing. So I spent the first like three or four months um, blanching and deveining sweetbreads and poking out bone marrow. <laughs> you moved to London at a, at a young age, and you ended up working at the oldest restaurant in London. Tell us about your experience there. Yeah, rules was amazing. So when I when I, I did a, a stint at a casino to start with, which was Crockford's, which was amazing again. But after working in like a, it's almost like like living in a bubble in a casino because you got the food cost uh, non-existent. You're using the best of what's on offer. So you got to use, you know, you got caviar, you got wild salmon coming down from Scotland, you got foie gras coming from France, squab pigeons, everything. Anything you need, it arrives. Go into rules. Now you have to use uh, you know, the basic ingredients. You have to learn to cook properly with the most humblest of ingredients and turn that into good food. So that was just amazing. You know, that, that was phenomenal. And then we used to work into, into the seasons really heavily. So we'd have the game season start. So early August, you'd have the grouse coming in. So the first grouse. That would all come down from Larkington Hall up in up near Newcastle. So we'd all come down on feather. So it's the first time I was, I've really, yeah, really had, you know, well hung game you know that had been left to you know to, to ferment literally on feather until we have it and it was just an amazing experience grouse pheasant widgeon teal you name it we had it red deer roe deer the lot it was an amazing experience 
you were in London at a time when Marco Peer White and Gordon Ramsay and the whole sort of celebrity chef was coming to the fore. But what were the real influences on you during that time as a chef? Yeah, um, so for me, my biggest epiphany was was Bruno Lube. Like working with him, he was the sort of guy who would take you under the wing. You know, he would um, he would run through all the reasons why every component is on the plate and why it's there. You know, he would go through, you know, he would be so um, into the produce, into the quality of the ingredients, into the quality of the chefs coming to the kitchen. For me, it was just like, wow, this is, I, I literally at that moment was like, this is the best time of my life. And I spent um, like seven years working with Bruno in, the, in London at that time. And that was just amazing. Do you have any stories from that time uh, in the kitchen that you can share? Um, I can share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the first time I really had like a um, like a eyes wide open moment with 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 pork was we had this one dish on. It was braised um, braised pork cheek with a chorizo in a crepinette and then slowly braise like an English style faggot as we used to call it back in the eighties and the seventies. Um, absolutely delicious. Something that company it was such a fragile, delicate dish but had so many robust flavors. You know, it's just amazing. And this is one of those dishes where you had to take such care of it during service. And at the time, we, we could be doing anything between 250 and maybe 380, 400 covers on the busiest night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these these little things would be, you know, like bobbing around in the, in the brassage on the service. And all of a sudden, if somebody just knocked the tray or knocked the pan a little bit too hard, then it would just release all the crepe in it, it would just float to the surface and you're just left with with nothing. Your, your little your little balls of uh, pork jowl and, uh, and chorizo are just gone, dissolved. And this happened once to me on a really busy sun, uh, Saturday night and Bruno was just standing there just looking at me and I was just like, I just wanted the, the world to open up and swallow me. Bruno had a real connection with uh, produce and producers. Do you have any stories of the connections made at that time? Well, we'd have a lot of guys coming through the kitchens, you know, delivering to us truffles, but anything from you know, from from a truffle to to caviar to to cauliflower to onions to baby baby vegetables. And it was just like, amazing for me to see in the centre of London all these farmers coming in and offering you know these amazing produce to. Uh, to the chef in the centre centre of London, you know, right on Regent Street, one of the busiest epicentres of the UK, and here we are having like amazing farm fresh produce. What led to the decision to move to Australia? Uh, so falling in love was the first one. Um, so yeah, as I'm sure many an English guy has found that out. <laughs> so yeah, so I met my 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 now ex wife Bernie over in London, um, and I made. It's a really tough decision to speak to Bruno and to leave, you know, leave his kitchen. So eventually plucked up the courage. We sat down, we had dinner together, me and Bruno. I said, oh, look, you know, I have to, I have to tell you I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to be moving to Australia. And he was like, really? I'm like, yeah, man, sorry. He's like, well, so am I. And I was just like, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm coming out in, in 2001. So I was due to come out here in 2000. So I spent the first year in Sydney. I worked up in Katoomba, Eccles Guest House, for, for six months. Then uh, I spent a bit of time back in Sydney when, uh, when the, the birth of my, uh, my first daughter, Kate. And then when Bruno arrived uh, in 2001, we moved up to Brisbane and we opened up uh, Bruno's Tables together. And we spent, yeah, we spent uh, about a year and a half up there together. And then we came back to Sydney. It was a chance of like, well, it's going to go two ways now, one or two ways. Either we go back to London and carry on, or we open a restaurant in Sydney. And that was the birth of Atelier. Well, you won many accolades uh, with Restaurant Atelier. Uh, tell us about what it was like creating your own venue and the challenges involved. It was amazing because we had the budget was minimal, literally minimal. And um, looking around for a site where you can, you know, you, you can offer something to a customer, yet you can still afford it as a as a restaurateur back in two thousand and three, was a was a huge challenge. So we settled on Newtown, and for us, Newtown was an amazing place. We really loved it. 
And that, that wasn't the first site. You ended up moving to Glebe. Tell us about that period of time and what the challenges involved in that. So having Cilia in, in Newtown and we were fully booked and we, it was a very small space and we, you know, we had the luxury of having you know, a full house every night. And it was a case of, well, you know, to progress further and to offer more to the customer, a, a, a better venue is exactly what we need. So looking around and it was, we found this, we just having a cup of coffee actually on Glee Point Road and we just saw this beautiful cottage just across the road for lease. And we're like, oh, look at this place. How beautiful is this? Like a little French auberge, you know? And we went in, had a look and just like, wow, this is the place. This is what I see Atelier moving into. And we moved in and we spent, uh, I think, eight years in Glee, yeah. That's where you made a real name for yourself and you had a real focus on connecting with farmers. Do you have any stories of some of the connections you made with pig farmers? Yeah, absolutely. So Anthony Cumnick was uh, my biggest connection. Um, he's down in the Grampians of Victoria. He had a Greenfield farm at the time and this is such a, an amazing progressive farmer. He was you know, one of the first out there doing the 100% free-range pigs. They were amazingly happy pigs i went down to the farm you know, you see you know the sows are walking around the piglets are just happy you know it's just an absolutely amazing place but what it came down to was the flavor in that pork was just phenomenal absolutely phenomenal and the the prosciutto that he would get from these hind legs was probably it still is the best australian prosciutto i've ever tasted just a pity he's still not at the farm at Atelier, you became renowned for some of the amazing things you were doing with the pork. Is there a dish or two that you can tell us about um, from your time there that you created? Um, we were doing a lot of pigs on the spit as well. For me, that was one of the, um, the biggest crowd pleasers we could do at the restaurant was on a Sunday, we do a lot of, um, so every fourth Sunday of the month, we do a, a masterclass. And quite often, pork was the how to do crispy crackling pork everybody wanted to know so that was the most high in demand class we had and that would end up with a uh, either a whole pork shoulder slow roasted overnight or we do a, a suckling pig on the spit and for me the, the, the suckling pig on the spit was what everybody just loved it was one of the biggest crowd pleasers you could possibly imagine but going back to the boudin noir that would be for me my personal favorite because that was such a a triumph in texture flavor and and skill set which not always was didn't always go right <laughs> well uh, tell us what it takes to make a great boudin noir and what you're doing on um, pasteurized fresh uh, um fresh blood and that's so hard to get hold of in australia as well and yeah the time and temperature all the ingredients the roasting of the spices there's so many elements there to uh, that can go wrong and can uh, turn the bitterness into the into the boudin but uh, yeah, it takes a lot of time and effort to make a good boudin. You mentioned that your master classes taught how to get amazing crispy crackling. Is there any secrets that you have that you can share? All right. So the biggest secret is keeping the pork belly dry overnight. Leave it in the in the fridge or in the cool room. Open, no no cling film. Pat it nice and dry with kitchen paper. Leave it to dry overnight. Then do not score it the next day before you put it in the oven. Just a little bit of vegetable oil salt into a very hot oven 220 230 for 15 minutes allow that crackling to form then turn oven down to 180 and just give it a nice roast maybe another 40 minutes depending on the thickness of the pork belly and that'd be perfect crackling every time restaurant atelier um won many accolades over its time what's what's the some of your fondest memories of the of running that restaurant um the chefs i had come through had some really good chefs come through. Um, one of them is Ed Lee. Um, he's now working in Copenhagen. He's a head chef of a, a two-star Jordan Air in, in, in Denmark. And working with, you know, with guys that come through when they're 18, 19 years old and seeing them progress through their apprenticeship and then go off and do great things, that to me was, was the best thing ever, for sure. And I, I still keep in touch with a lot of the chefs over the years that have come through. How, how do you describe your style of cooking? It was rooted in um, in French cookery, but and you've been using Australian ingredients. But tell us a bit about where you're at as a cook. Yeah, look, it's. I think the the best thing about being a chef is that you can be very progressive. You're always moving forward. So you know, even though my my foundations are 
firmly rooted in classical French food, coming into Australia opens you up to a, a multitude of new flavors I could never have even imagined before. So all these new flavors and textures and aromas that are you know, from, from Asian cookery that I, I tasted for the first time when I arrived here have all been um, uh, intertwined into what I've been doing now. So you see a lightness of flavors come through now, so some more pronounced flavors as opposed to like you know, the heaviness of the French style. Restaurant Atelier was um, in a, sort of a busy end of Glee Point Road in the suburbs, but you also worked looking over the city way up high at Obar uh, and dining with a sort of farm-to-table philosophy. What was it like working up there? Oh, it's, uh, it's amazing. So imagine when you, when you first start working with Michael, Michael Moore, um, the whole reason for, for bringing me on board as well was to take away so it was a heavy tourist restaurant, very tourism-based restaurant. We wanted to be able to move away from that situation and give this amazing view, this amazing restaurant and bar, back to Sydney ciders. So people, so locals can come celebrate the birthdays, Christmases, anniversaries, and have something special for Sydney ciders to come to. And that, to me, was was amazing. So it took a couple of years to to do that transformation, but we got there in the end. And uh, until this very day now, with, with COVID and no tourists coming in, Michael is uh, in Obar, is living off you know, that success for sure. It's fantastic. Tell us about the food that you were cooking and, and how you transformed that. Complete emphasis on local produce. So we had um, the guys up at Epicurean Harvest bringing down all their baby vegetables to us. You know, worked very closely with a lot of farmers and producers and fishermen in locally, uh, oysters locally from you and Makash. It was like it was everything had to be local. Um, the furthest thing we used was the WA Marin, you know. So everything was really Australian. I wanted people to sit there looking over, you know, one of the best harbours in the world, actually the best harbour in the world, and just enjoying some really good Australian produce. These days you're on the verge of um, opening... Uh, a new restaurant, Botswana Butchery. What, how did that come about? What can you tell us about it? Um, so Al and Russell, um, who own Botswana Butchery over in uh, New Zealand, uh, got in touch with me and just asked me a few questions. And we had a bit of a chat. And before we know it, we're, you know, we're signing the deal and off we go. And it's going to be a heavily meat-focused uh, restaurant. Um, we're going to have three different uh, levels. We're going to have a, a crustacean and raw bar uh, on the ground floor. It's going wow. to be yeah, a wood fired oven uh, and grill on the middle floor, and a rooftop bar on top. So it's going to be a, it's quite at, at the old uh, MOC center. It's all being completely renovated, and the project looks absolutely amazing. What sort of impact does running a kitchen and running a business with multifacets like this have on, on your creat creativity and, and how do you balance that? Well, I think creativity becomes, um, you can become more open because you have more places. You can use the whole fish, you can use the whole animal. You, you've got many levels where you can sell that product and the customer still gets the best and the freshest they can possibly have. So having just one, like at Atelier, I just had the one outlet here we can use over three outlets, which is like so much more open. Fantastic. You mentioned how the new restaurant will be quite meat focused. Do you, do you have a um, pork and meat program in place that you can tell us about? Um, I do indeed, but I can't tell you just yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have a uh, Hunter Valley uh, Wagyu, which is something that's very exciting. It's going to be exclusive to us as well, which I've been working on over the last couple of months. And yeah, so we're going to be using the best uh, the best meat Australia has to offer. What's some advice that you have for young chefs out there looking to build their career career and make a name for themselves? Find a kitchen that you enjoy. Once you don't feel you have to keep moving around, find the kitchen that you enjoy. Trust the chef who's there and. Like move through the kitchen, move through the ranks. You don't you don't have to move to all these different kitchens to become a good chef. Find a find a kitchen that you really enjoy and you're really happy with your cooking, and that will pay dividends one hundred percent. Really early on in your career, you'd learnt the art of butchering whole pigs. Um, 
tell us a bit about the versatility of the whole pig and how you can use every element in different in different dishes. There's nothing that goes to waste with a whole pig, that's for sure. I mean, from crispy ears to crispy tail and everything in between, there's it will all get used from it. And it also the preservation, the salting, there's nothing that you can't, you can't keep, you know, there's yeah. Amazing. Is there a favorite cut that you have and a favorite way that you cook it that you can tell us about? Uh, jow. I love jow for me, very underutilized. Uh, I mean, you see it in Guanciale all the time, but, uh, to have it, like confit, pressed, and then crisp up, very similar to like what uh, Peter Gilmore used to do at Key. To me, that's that's a, a flavour explosion from the the softness of the of the fat to the crispness of the skin. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> well, uh, Darren, very much looking forward to hearing more about what you do at uh, Botswana Butchery, and we've loved having you on the Crackling today to hear your story. Um, please keep in touch, and we'll catch up again soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Anthony. See you as well. This is The Crackling, a Deep in the Weeds production in partnership with Porkstar. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we catch up with some of Australia's best chefs and pork producers to discover what makes Australian pork so special.